Color him Father. The Bible has many names for God. Lots of fancy names. Names like Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Rapa, Jehovah Elohim, or even Jehovah Adane. Lots of fancy names for the Lord and proper names. And we could take a lot of time this morning and go through all of those names, but I think an easier way to do it would simply to be go and call and say that we could call him Father. So, Father has a lot of different connotations. It has an earthly connotation, but we're going to see here today in the Bible that it also has a connotation that applies from a biblical perspective. So we want to look at this father thing. We're going to start and we're going to look at the word father, but we're going to look at it from an earthly perspective. And to do that, we're going to use a song. And the song that we're going to use today to do that is by the Winstons back in 1969. It's called Color Him Father. And the song itself won a Grammy for Best Rhythm and Blues and sold more than a million records. The Winstons, Color Him Father. Now the man in my house, he's so big and strong. He goes to work each day and he stays all day long. He comes home each night looking tired and beat. He sits down at the dinner table and has a bite to eat. Never a frown, always a smile When he says to me, how's my child? I said that I've been studying hard all day in school Trying very hard to understand the golden rule I think I'll call this man father Color him father I think I'll color him love Color him love I said I'm gonna color him father Color him father I think I'll color the man love Yes I will he says education is a thing if you want to compete Because without his son, life ain't very sweet I love this man and I don't know why Except I'll need his strength until the day that I die My mother loves him and I can tell By the way she looks at him when he holds my little sister Nell I heard her say just the other day That if it hadn't have been for him She couldn't have found her way I think I'll call him father Color him father I'm gonna call him love Color him love I've got to call on your father Color him father I think I'll call on this man love Color him love She said she thought that she could never love again And then there he stood with that big white grin He married my mother and he took us in And now we belong to the man with that big white grin I got to color this man father Color him father I'm gonna color him love Color him love I've got to color him father Color him father I'm gonna color this From 1969, the Winstons sang that song. The Winstons, when they sang that song, were talking about an earthly father. Now, when I listen to that song, that sounds like a pretty good earthly father to me. His father took in a family, seven kids, loved them, never complained, always had a smile on his face, worked hard. That's a pretty good earthly father. Some of us have been blessed to have fathers like that. Some of us not. It all depends. Each situation is different. The key for you to remember 
is that our Father in heaven, anything an earthly father could do, our Father in heaven can do beyond that and more and does beyond that. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, it says, if you know as an earthly father how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, good gifts to those who ask him? The Bible is telling you flat out, no matter how good an earthly father you may or may not have, he will do more and owe so much more. The book of James goes on to say, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father and heavenly lights. God is the one that brings us the perfect gifts. God is the one that answers our prayers. An earthly father is important, yes, but the God in heaven, that's the father that we can depend on. The Bible tells us, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. God, our father, wants our joy to be full. He wants us to ask. Now, you have to ask within his will, that's for sure. But when you ask within his will, he delights in answering your prayer and giving you what you want. So if you had an earthly father like the Winstons in this song, that's fantastic. But if you didn't, if, if you had a father that maybe wasn't even there, we have a father in heaven that's always there and he's always there for you. I wanna take you back to March 25th, 2010. There's a woman, her name was Kate Og. She was pregnant with twins. She knew twins were coming. And those twins came early. They came at 27 weeks, so they were premature. The one twin was just fine. The other twin came out stillborn. And so for Kate, as you can imagine, the mother, this was heartbreaking. The doctor spent 20 minutes on the stillborn child trying to resusc resuscitate that baby. 20 full minutes didn't work. Nothing happened. That baby would not breathe. The doctors and the nurses obviously felt bad for Kate. They knew she had lost her child. The other one lived, but this twin did not. And so as a way of letting her say goodbye, they took this <coughs> child, this stillborn child, and they laid it on the mother's chest. And there was going to be a goodbye there of just a couple of minutes where the mom could say goodbye to the child. The child laid there for a couple of minutes, and then all of a sudden, the child began moving. Now, the parents got pretty excited, but the doctor said, no, no, it's just a reflex action when someone dies. And we know that's true. Sometimes there are reflex actions after death. So their hopes were lifted and all of a sudden dashed by the doctors in just a few minutes. The mother begged for a little bit more time with her child to say the goodbyes. That little bit more time turned into two hours. She wouldn't let that child, that stillborn child, go. It laid there on her chest. After two hours, the child opened its eyes. The parents were just ecstatic. They couldn't believe it. But the doctor said, no, just like before. It's a reflex action. There's no way this baby could be alive, yet after two hours, the baby opened its eyes. The doctors finally gave up. They, they left the room. They said, hey, this baby is dead. We're so sorry. There's nothing more we can do. A couple minutes later, the doctors heard this huge commotion in the room, and they ran back in. They didn't know what was going on, and the baby was moving, and the doctor was going to put an end to this one way or the other. He got out of his stethoscope, and he put it on the baby, and then he started shaking his head, and he said, I can't believe it, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. The baby was alive. Talk about miracles. Talk about biblical miracles. This was one, because remember, hours had passed. You can't survive without oxygen. You're going to be brain dead at best if they could bring you back, but this baby was a healthy baby. It was a miracle. Afterwards, when they looked at this, the doctors looked at it and the nurses and the parents, they talked about why. What had happened? What had made the difference that this baby survived? And they all agreed on one thing. They agreed on that the closeness of the baby 
as it laid on its mother's chest, the warmth from the mother, the closeness is what made the difference. Now, I want you to think of God, the Father, the same way. The closer you can get to him, the better it is for you. Just like for that baby. If they had taken that baby right away, there's no way the baby would have lived. No chance whatsoever. But it was close to the mother. Same thing with God. The closer we can get to him, the better for us. The book of Isaiah tells us this in no uncertain terms. It says in Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord. Now, before we go any farther in the verse, I want to tell you what the word wait means. The word wait doesn't mean stand around with your hand on your hip and tapping your toes and just kind of waiting for something to happen. Here in the Bible, this word wait means to bind, it means to weave, it means to get closer. So the Bible is here is saying to you, you, if you'll wait, if you'll bind with the Lord, if you'll get closer to the Lord, you, and here's the good news, you'll renew your strength. You'll mount up with wings as eagles, you'll run, you'll not be weary, and you'll walk and you won't faint. All from one thing, getting closer to, the, to God. It's not even talking about being a good Christian or being obedient. It's just talking about get closer to God, just like that little baby got closer to the mother. When you can get closer to God, all kinds of good things are going to happen for you. Now, the Bible gives us a classic example about God the Father. Remember, like the Winstons in the song, there's the earthly father, but again, our father in heaven, he's on a level that's hard to imagine sometimes. So let's look at this Bible story, and it's the story of Adam and Eve. But before we get into the story, let's check out the backstory. We like to see what was happening back when these stories are taking place in the Bible, because this is true stuff. These are true stories. So this Adam and Eve story, it's in the beginning. The Bible starts with the words, in the beginning, God created. We're going back all the way to the very beginning before there was anything. There was no planet. There was no earth. There was no heaven. There was no earth. One of my favorite lines in the early Bible in Genesis is, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God was calling things into existence. You want to talk about a powerful father. Here's a father that can just speak words and make things happen in your life. An earthly father, not so easy to just speak words and make things happen, but a heavenly father, our father, he spoke things into existence. He spoke us into existence. So it's the very beginning. We're going way back in time. Now, it's important to note that thousands of years later, when Jesus comes on the scene, he also refers to the father. There's more than 150 times in the New Testament that Jesus himself references God as the Father. So Jesus got this concept of this special Father, this God Father, that can do things for us that an earthly father cannot do. So let's pick up the story in Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 7. Let's see what it says. It says, In the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Okay, if you've got life, if you're breathing today, if you're in the TV audience or at Supermobile Church, your breath, your breath of life came right from God. It didn't come from an earthly father. It came from God himself. So God creates. He starts from the very beginning and he creates a man. Who is the man? Adam. He creates Adam. The first man to walk the planet is Adam. But that's not enough. It says, then God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Now, we've all heard about the Garden of Eden. What a special place the Bible tells us this was. A, a special place of plenty, of fruit, of, of all kinds of good things, a place of peace. So God not only creates a man, Adam, but he creates the Garden of Eden. And Adam's job is to work in the Garden of Eden. We all work. We're all doing something on this planet to make a difference. And that was Adam's job. He was a gardener, if you will. So that's his job. And the Lord gave Adam some guidelines. He gives you some guidelines, too, in life. Most of those guidelines are right here in this book, 
the Bible. He gives us some guidelines, tells us some things to do and some things not to do. So what was the guideline that he gave Adam? He says to Adam, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. However, you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's one tree in this entire vast garden that Adam is not to eat of. God tells him directly, there's no beating around the bush here. Don't eat from that tree. Why? God says that if you do, you will certainly die. So back then, before this happened, God was talking about eternal life for people. Now, we have eternal life, but in a different way, and that's through Jesus. And that's a whole other sermon, but we have eternal life promised through Jesus Christ. But back here, before the Garden of Eden, before there was trouble, God was saying, don't eat that tree, because if you do, you're going to die. God cared so much about Adam, he went a step further. He didn't just say, here's this wonderful garden for you. He knew he needed a mate. So here's what he says in the next verse. He said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Who's that? That's Eve, Adam and Eve. So now God is finishing the package off. He's got Adam, he's got Eve, he's created the Garden of Eden, he's creating everything by speaking it into existence. It says, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. That's the rib of Adam. So now we've got the two. Now, here's where the story takes a left turn. Here's where the story gets interesting because the serpent comes into the story now, the snake. The Bible says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other animals. So we've got this serpent and it's crafty and what does it do? The serpent goes to the woman and he says to her, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. The serpent is testing the woman, testing Eve. He's going basically, hey, God, did God really say that? Huh? Really? What does Eve do? Well, she responds properly. And she says, God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. So Eve knew. She knew. She quoted right back to the serpent, no way. We're not supposed to eat of this tree. If we do, we'll die. I love the answer of the serpent. Talk about crafty. He says, you will not certainly die. Totally flat out lies to her. I don't know what, whether there's a smile on his face when he did it, but he flat out lies to her. Basically says, no way, you're not going to die. God said you would, but no, you won't. Don't you worry about it. What does the woman do? Well, she's taken in. The Bible says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, don't you know that sometimes sin is pleasing to the eye? Sometimes we get into stuff that our eyes lead us into, and we're like, holy smokes, once we get into it. How did I get into this? And this is what happened to Eve. The serpent tricks her. He tricks her, and she falls for it because her eyes, she sees this tree that looks pleasing. And so she's now, she's, she's into it, and it's too late. The Bible goes on to say, she ate, and she also gave some to her husband. She, she pulls poor Adam into the story. So this is not a good thing. She has fallen for the serpent's line, and now her husband, he must have been pretty gullible too because he does what his wife does, and he also eats from the tree. Now, the story goes on to say that God's not happy about this. God is not happy that they disobeyed him. He gave them all, everything they needed. He gave it all to them. He just said, don't eat of that tree. Leave that one alone. The rest, it's all yours. We do the same thing sometimes. Sometimes God will bless us, and sometimes we will do, in spite of the blessing, we'll do the wrong thing. We'll go, well, I got that blessing, but I want that over there. It's pleasing to my eye, and we'll go for it. And when we do, there's going to be consequences, and they're not going to be good. And they weren't good here. Now, before I tell you the consequences for them eating of this tree, let me remind you of how the story plays out. God confronts them because they're hiding in the garden. He confronts them. He said, what happened? What's going on here, Adam and Eve? What, what happens here? The first thing that happened is, is Adam blames Eve. He says, it was her fault. She brought me the fruit. It's her fault. He doesn't take any responsibility. 
We do the same things in life too. Sometimes we go down the wrong way and we blame the closest person to us. No, it wasn't me, it was her, it was him. But mature adults take responsibility for their own actions. So Adam blames Eve. I love what Eve does. Does she take responsibility? No way. She blames the serpent. She says, it was the serpent's fault. He tempted me. So there's no responsibility to be taken here by Adam or Eve. So what was the bottom line? The bottom line to this whole thing was, is they got banished from the Garden of Eden. This, this spectacular place, they got banished. But I want you to remember this. Even though God, there were consequences with God here, and even though God banished them from the Garden of Eden, he didn't banish them from his life. God didn't desert them. He didn't walk away from them. The Father stayed with them. And we know this for a fact because thousands of years later, the Father sends the Son, Jesus, to make up for that sin in the Garden of Eden and to make up for your sin and for my sin and basically to give us eternal life through Jesus Christ. So who is this Father that Jesus speaks of 150 times in the New Testament? It's the same Father that loved Adam and Eve in spite of the fact they sinned from the get-go. I say, color him Father. It's the same Father that parted the Red Sea and save the Israelites from the Egyptians who are bearing down on them. I say, call to that man, Father. It's the same Father that stood with David as he fought Goliath, the biggest, baddest dude on the entire planet, and made sure when David threw that sling and that stone that it would hit Goliath in the one spot that he didn't have armor. I say, call to that man, Father. It's the same Father that says, if you will wait upon the Lord, bind with him, weave with him, join with him, that you'll renew your strength. You'll mount up with wings as eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. I say, color him father. And most important, it's the same father that sent his son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago and hung on the cross and paid for your sins and my sins so that we would have life and we'd have it more abundantly. I say, color him father. Hello friends, my name is David Timothy, but on the streets of Dallas, they call me the soup man. And with me today is my lovely wife, Shanna. Hello everyone and welcome to Soupmobile Church. We are so happy to have you with us today. Soupmobile Church is a one of a kind church on the entire planet. It's because it's the home church for the homeless right here in Dallas, Texas. The homeless have never had their own home church until now. However, we want you to know that the Soupmobile is more than just a church ministry. Shanna, can you tell us about the birth of the Soupmobile? The Soupmobile was founded in 2003 on a wing and a whole lot of prayers. <laughs> Amen to that. So the Soupmobile mission statement is three simple words spoken by Jesus himself more than 2,000 years ago. Shanna, can you tell us what those three words are? Feed my sheep. That's right. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. At the Soupmobile, we feed his sheep in four separate and distinct ways. First, we literally feed his sheep. The Soupmobile is a mobile soup kitchen serving more than 250,000 meals per year to the homeless right here in Dallas, Texas. The second way we feed his sheep is the Soupmobile shelters the homeless. Our shelter program is transitional. It's designed to take a homeless man or woman right off the streets, put a safe roof over their heads, help them get a job, and then when they're ready, return them as working, productive members of the community. Our shelter program is a hand up, not a handout. The third way that we feed his sheep is at Christmas. Every year at Christmas, the Soupmobile takes 500, yes, 500 homeless men, women, and children, and we put them up for Christmas at the downtown Dallas Omni Hotel. They all get new clothes, fabulous gifts, lots of love, and we hold a huge mega banquet for them and in their honor. But most important, when they wake up on Christmas morning, it's in a warm, safe bed at the spectacular Dallas Omni Hotel, not in a cardboard box under a bridge somewhere. And the fourth way, 
that the Soupmobile feeds his sheep is Soupmobile Church. And for us, this is the icing on the cake. The homeless have been called the largest unevangelized population in the United States. The Soupmobile Church is laser-like focused on bringing Christ to the homeless right here in Dallas, Texas. So that's it in a nutshell. The Soupmobile is really four missions in one. We feed the homeless, 250,000 meals a year. We shelter the homeless. We give them a magical Christmas. And of course, Soupmobile Church, bringing Christ to the homeless right here in Dallas, Texas. So ask yourself, do you like what we're doing? Do you think it has merit? If you do, I would ask you to give prayerful consideration to joining the Soupmobile Dream Team. What's the Dream Team? Well, it's people like you and me that have a passion for serving Christ and like the mission of the Soupmobile. What's it gonna to cost to join the Soupmobile Dream Team? It's $5 a month. Yes, that's it, $5 a month. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that your $5 a month can't possibly make much of a difference in the life of a homeless person. And you would be absolutely right. Your $5 individually can't make much of a difference. But your $5, along with the $5 of thousands of other Dream Team members, can and will make a huge difference in the life of the homeless right here in Dallas, Texas. So how do you join the Dream Team? Simple. Go to our website, soupmobile.org org soupmobile.org click on the dream team button read all about it and if you still like it you can join the dream team right online and as our special way of saying thank you we're going to send you when you join the dream team this special commemorative coin that my wife shanna is holding on the front of this coin is a picture of jesus and it says feed my sheep john 21 16 and then on the reverse side of the coin it says feeding and sheltering the homeless since 2003. And then at the very bottom, it says, God bless America. So when you join the Soupmobile Dream Team, we'll send you this special keepsake coin. It's an impressive coin. It weighs in at 58 grams. And I promise you, it's a keepsake that you'll be proud to have in your home. Well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. May the Lord bless and keep you all.